Oh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce tonight's feature speaker, Paul Cannell. Come on up here uh, from O'Day Engineers. Uh, we have been talking about, you know, lots of different topics that we present on, and thermal bridging comes up a, a lot. It's something that's very unique with Passive House in terms of the attention that we pay to these, these thermal bridging details. So Paul has put together a presentation for us tonight. Um, he's open to questions during this, so raise your hand. We can take a few. Folks online, I'll be monitoring the chat room so we can get to your questions as well. So as appropriate, you can get to questions during the presentation, and the rest we'll address afterwards and try to get them all, all done. All right, come on over, take over. Uh, and you can use the arrows here. Awesome. <clears throat> like Aaron said, my name is Paul Cunell. I work for a day engineers. Uh, Paul Cunell, I'm a structural engineer licensed in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a project director at O'Day Engineers. I've spent the last 12 years at the engineers, now a member of WSP. Um, prior to that, I worked at a firm out in Michigan for a year, in the AE firm doing mostly industrial type work. Um, and normally I wouldn't really focus on the schooling aspect, but I think it kind of is relevant to why I'm interested in like passing out design. Um, just give a little background. I went to Penn State and I studied architectural engineering and bachelor's and master's of artificial engineering. Uh, with the focus in structures. I think for anybody who doesn't know about architectural engineering, it's, you know, a, a engineering construction management with the focus on the vertical built environment. So design of all building systems, mechanical reach back, electrical, lighting, structural, structure management, focused solely on building design. And I think as we get more focused on high performance buildings, having students out of school uh, that have been focused on building design is going to be an important aspect of our future workforce, whether that's architects or engineers or whomever that might be. Um, I didn't take any courses in traffic, engineering, you know, wastewater management, any of that kind of stuff. I took courses in like HVAC design, thermodynamics, electrical, lighting, construction management, and things like that. And I think as we kind of look through the future of our students, having more well-equipped engineers in the workforce and um, construction professionals, I think is really a benefit we all can realize as we kind of move through that um, you know, building design. So enough about me. Uh, the outline of today's session is we really want to identify some of the key tenets in passive building design. I am not a building scientist. I'm not going to pretend that we're going to gloss over this aspect of I assume pretty much everyone in the room knows more about the key tenets than I do. Um, but we're going to focus today on thermal bridging. Uh, we'll identify the most common sources of thermal bridging and practical strategies for mitigation. Um, and then we'll review a little bit of the current state of structural engineering practice you know, from my lens and for the future industry needs uh, with respect to thermal bridging. Um, and then we'll review some common thermal break products. I have no affiliation with any product manufacturer, but uh, I think there's key components to each product that engineers, architects, whomever should be able to delegate these products or you know, reviewing them during shop drawings, getting product submittals, all that kind of stuff. Important that you understand what each of them does slightly differently. Like Aaron said, anybody has any objections, or questions, comments, just shout them, throw your tomatoes, all that kind of stuff. Um, quick slide, passive building principles. You know, as I understand the four key tenants in kind of passive building principles, thermal control, air control, radiation control, and moisture control. Um, we're gonna focus on the thermal control asset. You know, controlling energy loss to the building envelope or straight energy loss, but as well as mitigating that moisture control or condensation inside your water resistant through uh, your vapor barrier. As I was putting this presentation together, I think one thing that kind of stuck out to me is in building sciences and structural engineering, we think a lot about paths. 
Yeah, I think in, the key to my job as a structural engineer is above all else is making sure we have a continuous load path. You know, if there's one thing you need to get right in a building structure, it's that continuous load path. Load's got to go from the floor, beams, down to columns, eventually into foundations and soil. And as I understand with building science is that weather resistant barrier is like the key to all. You get the weather resistant barrier and your um, ventilation, right? You've got most of the way there. Um, thank you, Buildings and Beyond podcast from the SWA. I, you know, <laughs> I learned a couple of things. So um, I, I like this idea of being able to relate these two types of paths because they have, they can conflict, but they can kind of work together at some points. And I hope that that's what we kind of get across in the rest of this presentation, how we can work with the load path and make sure that we're providing a consistent load path that also allows for a consistent weather WRB. Design, I've been on a couple of projects. I'm not a passive house designer. I'm not a certified passive house designer, but I've been on a number of projects um, that are passive house projects, whether in design or constructed or construction. Um, and one thing that struck, sticks out to me is like, we can't have early enough collaboration. Um, yeah, I know all of, who is the architect in the room? What about like building sciences, novel consulting? Okay, structural engineers. So we can't have early enough collaboration. Um, or more and more on our projects. Yeah, our early package, the early structural package should just be like written into whatever the sequence is because we're issuing early documents. Sometimes I got two projects going on 40% CDs and 60% CDs. Sometimes six to nine months before the rest of the building is even completed and details are like worked out. That like the earlier we can get that collaboration into like SD uh, for some of these key details. And I'm not saying it needs to be finalized. This is a sketch uh, that will be familiar on one of the projects. Um, this is an early sketch we worked out with envelope consultants to kind of say like, hey, we know we're going to have brick on this building. We're going to have to relieve it around the buildings. Here's what we're thinking. This is initial sketch of what we're thinking. We know we need thermal breaks. I don't know how thick it needs to be. And I need you to help me figure out where it should be. But these early sketches and these early kind of collaboration efforts are really just going to become necessary we can't just kind of go back and forth with narratives during asking phase. You know, with like early submissions and things like that, we really need to be collaborating as early as possible. And I can see that that being like a receptive thing. I feel like the building sciences probably want to be brought on early and earlier into these aspects as well. Um, and then the other thing, so. I kind of gotten like in our office this idea, you know, Paul's done a couple of passive house projects. Let's ask him what we need to what we need to know for the next passive house project because everybody's got one on their docket now. And one thing I've kind of come across is like really defining where is the passive house envelope because it's not always the entire building. Sometimes we've got like a multi-family building with parking underneath or half parking underneath. Uh, maybe there's retail on the ground floor, and we're considering that outside of the passive house envelope. You know, maybe we're even considering a school with like career and technical education spaces, and we're saying, you know, uh, the auto shops outside of the passive house envelope, or all these other places. And really defining exactly where, or as early as possible, defining where that passive house envelope lies. You know, we can make a lot of those early decisions as we're laying out a column grid, as we're thinking about where we might locate thermal breaks with respect to the length of the beam um, to get the best ideal location in terms of the moment on that beam and all these kind of things that make for economical structural designs and and then as we move through the process. 
you know, understanding if there are material specific requirements of certain types of connections. One thing I see come up a lot is like, you know, a suggestion of using stainless steel connections. And I completely understand why that is and why we would do it. It's just one of those things like if we're using a specific product, you know, we want to know, do we need to spec that stainless steel product for like early pricing? Should it be, can it be a galvanized product? Um, all that kind of stuff. So having that understanding of like what kind of pro products or what kind of materials that we're thinking, it's kind of ties into that thickness of a thermal break, all this kind of thing. It's helpful to understand them as early as we can. And I think that involves a lot of collaboration amongst all of our parties in this room, so. All right, today I'm a hand sketcher. I, I love to sketch. Um, I know I'm young and whatever, but I, I started off sketching in school and I, I love to sketch. I get, I, you know, get Paul the architect at work, you know, sometimes, but like I, I like to sketch and put these things together. It helps me focus and it helps me kind of see through the noise of the details without seeing all like the itty bitty nuance that can distract sometimes. Um, so today, you know, and thinking through how we present this, I really thought, let's look at just a building and let's identify where all the kind of key locations of thermal breaks. Well, well, I missed one or two, but hopefully I got most of the, the gist of most of them. You know, thinking about things like, a, a, mostly focus on a square frame building, but we'll throw in some concrete and maybe a little wood in there too. Uh, things like, you know, the foundation, junction of the foundation, slab on grade, the interior columns, you know, a parapet, sun inch column, roof screen, balcony, canopy, tie rod, all that kind of stuff. All right, slabs on grade like the easiest structural detail, but it's seemingly the most complicated from the grid. Well, it's very complex from a thermal standpoint, how you support the side and all this kind of stuff. So on the right is just like it, I mean, we see this on pretty much a lot, a lot of jobs. And forgive me if I didn't get the rigid insulation on the right side of the wall, I did my absolute best of where that should be located. But you guys can tell me and interject if I got it on the right side or not. But so on the right would be a detail that we use frequently. You know, you might carry that rigid insulation for you in from the, the slab edge. Or that masonry. In New England, we got a lot of masonry, rain screen type assemblies, you know, masonry, air battery, continuous insulation. Um, kind of cut and dry detail. We do that all the time. Um, you get that cold formed interior wall assembly with the chip on the inside. It's covering up that slab to wall joint, all that kind of great stuff. On the detail on the left, it gets a little trickier because you want to kind of insulate that slab edge. You're not getting a continuous, you know, thermal ridge from the exterior foundation wall through the wall stem into the slab on grade. So you think about bringing up that, that rigid insulation. Uh, the tricky part there is now you all of a sudden have that top of your insulation exposed from the inside. So what do you do? Uh, I've seen a couple of details where maybe you have like a little base kind of cold form stud, maybe three and five eighths or something, you know, on a six inch stud, or maybe even because you want to take advantage of a little bit more cavity insulation to like an eight inch wall stud. So right now I'd be picking sort of what would be a six inch wall stud, but maybe that wall stud grows a little bit more to cover up that rigid insulation. Um, and you get a little bit of an overhang <clears throat> from that wall stud. Now, the key there is providing a foundation wall assembly that allows you to build the envelope as fast as possible. If there's anything that I have come to understand is that the schedule is going to drive all in a project and the contractor will make it known that it drives everything um and it's true so we got to provide a building that's going to allow for the most flexibility and sort of some of that scheduling within the reason right but like 
one thing with cold foam exterior walls, the more we can allow that cold foam wall or whatever the exterior wall symbol is to sit on that foundation, the better off we are, even at that like overhangs just a little bit. Um, this will, if you were to bump that to an eight inch stud to cover up that ridges and build the foundation wall, correct your eight inch wall stud on it, it can still be fastened into the stem wall. It's going to cover up that ridge insulation and get this on the outside and covers up the joint. Another common like alternate detail that I kind of put in there, or a little aside, is that like taper that beveled cut to the side on grade. I'm sure we've all seen that and we'll probably all draw on it too, right? Um, I, you know, I take no real issues with the detail. I would just say to be cautioned with exactly what kind of finished materials you use on that slab on grade. You know, anytime you take like a four inch slab on grade and start beveling down the edge on say like a polished concrete slab or a slab with some kind of a rigid material like a tile that might show through if you see a little bit of cracking in that slab edge, you just, it's an element of risk. Right, there's no, it's, it's not really a structural concern, but with any project, you gotta balance risk and everything else. So, um, you know, with the kind of bird's mouth cut on that, on a, on a tapered cut on that, you do run the risk of a little bit of cracking at that slide edge, for sure. All right, so another common one, threshold details of the foundation wall. The detail at the top, I've we've been drawing for years, ever since I can remember, conscious lab on both sides of threshold, doweling from the top. Um, in New England, we get a lot of cold winters, right? You get frosty on the exterior slab, and that slab can lift up and impede door swing going out of the building. Um, so we have always haunched slabs on grade. It's actually now a requirement of the 2021 IDC to make sure that your exterior slabs at thresholds are frost protected. What that means, it is up for interpretation. I've seen details in other parts of the country where there like is a void basically underneath all thresholds. Um, there's a lot of interpretation there to what frost protected means. Um, but suffice it to say, you need something that's gonna restrain that slab at least uh, for a length of a door swing that's going to allow you to get out of a building and not create a situation to like run in risk of ADA miscompliance or uncompliance where you're creating a lip at the slab edge threshold. Uh, so an easy one to do would be to create put a rigid installation but the problem with that is you still got your thermal bridging from slab to slab, slab foundation wall to slab. So another detail sort of, you know, on the books that coming up with is like, do you bring that threshold out to the edge of the foundation wall? Bring that threshold out as far as you can and put your ridges on the outside of the building. I'm not an expert in aluminum thresholds and things like that at first, but I might need to get something that does something similar to that. But, um, you know, at that point, you just run a dowel, like a yeast free style that's going to allow like in and out out of expansion, but also mitigate any sort of shear transfer across the haunch slab and the exterior slab on grade. Um, I didn't see any dowel spec that stain steel dowels. I know that helps with like the thermal conductivity across the point. Um, I'd say it's this, they're like, Thermally improved and then you're thermally kind of broken, mostly thermally broken detail in terms of what you do with the threshold while still having a slab on the exterior that is kind of rigidly connected to your building. Um, like I said, that is a detail that will be, you know, the IBC 2021 is the first time it was written in that uh, exterior slabs on grade need to be. Frost protected at both points. So, that include things like pavement and uh, sidewalks. That's a great question. If it, uh, and that's where I feel like there's ambiguity there. I think it anywhere that you have a threshold, anywhere that there's the potential for frost on the outside of a building where you're trying to exit a building, um, 
whether that means you have to put like a concrete slab below pavement, which is a common detail you would see in like landscape architecture. But that we do a lot of podium construction, whether that's you know multifamily podium. We also do multifamily podium where you got a podium and then five levels of wood above. Or it's just a podium for the sake of a podium and concrete and steel above that as well. We also do a lot of post tension concrete. Um, this detail is a detail we kind of worked out um, that where you would have like a post tension concrete slab and maybe like a floating floor slab above it. So below this post tension concrete slab is like a parking garage, a buried parking garage. And above that, you have a residential building starting your asset house envelope above that slab. Um, we have a floating floor slab to minimize depressions in the post tension slab and make that as nearly constructible as possible, which is sometimes a challenge for sure on projects. Um, it involves a lot more rivet above the slab, but it also allows for things like Say you have a bathroom on the first floor and you want to run that piping within that so you get interstitial space. Um, maybe you have a you have a uh, a, a kitchen in your hotel restaurant on that first floor right. level, and you have no idea what that kitchen is going to be because we never do when we start that project. Um, some of these void spaces are really like allow for um, a lot of flexibility as we move through the construction of the project. Um, so maybe for like a little bit of upfront cost in terms of like having a lot of that rigid gives you all that continuous installation while also providing the future flexibility to do what you need and install that slab on grid at a little date. The issue becomes like, what do you do with the building envelope when you're bringing it down? Maybe you have an 18 foot first floor and you're bringing curtain wall down and sitting it on that slab on grid. Um, we want something rigid at that slab edge. Uh, we don't want to float the slab edge the entire that slab the entire way. Having something like uh, you know, uh, an AAC CMU, like a aerated enclave concrete masonry unit, um, basically like a CMU unit with a lot more air in that. It's going to have a better thermal conductivity value than its traditional CMU, or like a a um, a concrete curb. Otherwise, this would be a in most projects, this would just be a concrete curb. There are other products out there. Um, thermal bridging solutions makes one called like a thermal block, which is basically like a grouted concrete cylinder. Um, insulated patch that would allow you to have that kind of compression on the slab as at that point. Yes, they have considered geofoam. I think one of, and I think the I love the geofoam. It's great. Um, I am really enthused. Things about like glass foam aggregate and things like that that allow you to like pour and pack and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think one of the interesting things is like, you know, anytime you have like lateral load coming into the building and you're attaching to that slab on grade, you need to resolve it somewhere. Um, and having sort of these connections through elements that we know have a defined frictional value. Is helpful. I mean, truly, it's a humongous slab on grade. So, like, hey, there's probably a way to get it to work. Um, but I think the project that this was used on as well had some kind of like some stem walls that came up beyond like a curtain wall and stuff like that. So, it made sense to have like a nice meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, there's something hidden behind this picture if you're gonna have to forgive me a little bit here, but I'll the <clears throat> our frequent request that I see is to put a thermal break below columns. 
And this is one I struggle with a lot. Um, this is one I, there's supposed to be like an X on this, and I apologize for that not being there. It's really detail, and it's, it's in the background on this image. I was scanning all the images in at the So the issue I have here is like, if you look at some product manufacturers, you'll have like a thermal break material that's pretty sizable. Um, it's mainly meant like, the, if you look at the compression values for that material, um, for the amount of strain that it sees, like the deflection of the load. Um, it mainly meant for like fairly lightly loaded elements, things like freezers and stuff where you're going to have like one story, if that, of load. Putting a thermal break under like a building column is a real challenge to resolve. I apologize for the sketch issue. Yeah. Shoot. Um, so just to clarify, are you saying that the break that like foundation columns is a iffy, maybe no go, but maybe like at a root penetration? We're going to get there. Okay. 100%. <laughs> yeah. But I would say no at a foundation. That's my own opinion. The problem is you could have a couple hundred thousand pounds of load coming into a column with like a 14 by 14 base plate. And just like spreading that load over the base plate is not going to be reasonable when you take into account like the creep that occurs underneath. So like the deflection that will occur over time underneath that, coupled with the amount that you already anticipate under like loaded by soils. This to me is like a really kind of tricky one to involve or uh, to resolve. But you know, as I've kind of understood there are a few other levers we can pull whether we like jacket a column with some insulation up to a certain height or a few other methods how effective these are i understand but um they can't all be perfect all right canopies they're all the time they happen right um you guys have probably seen this Similar-esque detail a bunch of times. Um, what we have here is an HSS canopy outrigger coming in and penetrating the building envelope. At that insulated point, we provide a thermal break with a uh, backpack end plate moment connection. Um, and what I wanted to kind of like stress here is that what you really hope want out of these connections is that end plate moment connection that's going to go above and below the section depth. And that is what I see to be the real challenge with some of these connections, because all the time you've got a building envelope coming in, maybe it's curtain wall, maybe it's brick or something else, and it's always coming in like right at the point where you also want to put in this thermal brake that has bolts sticking off of it and all this kind of stuff. So the reality of it is to resolve, you know, we all took some level of structural classes. So if I like pull back on it a little bit, you know, in a cantilever condition, you got all your tension coming out of the bolt at the top and your compression resolving at the bottom of that member. Um, so having the bolt at the top, like the furthest away from the neutral axis is going to give you best load carrying resistance. Um, so can it be shrunk depending on what kind of load that you're bringing to it? Yes, but you might need more outriggers to involve that load. And like, then are you just fighting yourself by putting more kind of point, uh, thermal break, thermal bridges through the building envelope? Um, so what I would say is like having, being able to plan for sort of this end plate moment connection is a real important aspect of having these canopy outriggers to the building envelope. You see all the time, but you're always drawn to stay. Yeah, that's a great question. 
Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but if I were thinking mostly around geometry, I'd say like a good four inches is probably a good aspect of things. Maybe looking at six inches, okay. somewhere between four and six inches, because you're getting above like the top of that HSS with enough clearance for like the bolts and maybe a washer if you need it. And you got a little bit of edge distance from the whole center to the edge of that plate. Okay. Something around those ones. The other thing I would mention about this is like, as structural engineers, we're great at delegating things. We're terrific at writing notes that delegate responsibility to everybody else, right? Uh, we delegate cold foam design a lot of times. We delegate connect steel connections a lot of times, which is like mostly an East Coast thing. We were talking about this earlier, but. Uh, and that has a lot to do with like we're not very in like high seismic regions. We give a lot of the flexibility to the design of connections to steel fabricators who hire their own specialty structural engineer to do it. There's no reason you can't delegate a thermal if your engineer on a project is not feeling super comfortable with the design of some of these connections. There's no reason you can't delegate that national design. Um, I have seen plenty of delegated connection designs for thermal breaks um, on other passive house projects. Um, so there are plenty of engineers out there if you're not feeling comfortable to it at this point in time, or you just as part of your standard operating procedures um, that will design the connection. We'll get into some of the nuance later of that, but. All right, at the top, let's say you have a canopy, like a hanger rod type of connection. Um, very similar kind of concept. The reason I show this is like, I've shown many of tubes in a cab, it's like a, a wall stud, right? Uh, we love our tubes all the time. And I've come to understand tubes are problematic when you're also in passive house buildings, you have continuous insulation. You're looking at the WRB, but then you might also have a lot of cavity insulation as well. And every time I put a tube in there, I just got like a hollow tube of air that's taking up what should be cavity insulation. So the ability to minimize tubes is like, it's twofold. You kind of, it takes a little bit from everybody, but for something like this, like a canopy outrigger, um, there's no reason that can't be like the back-to-back -back channels. Um, Tubes are great because they come in a lot of varying sizes. They have a lot of torsional resistance, um, but they're readily available in smaller sizes. That this kind of connection would work really easily for that. Um, however, like a back-to-back -back channel, um, you can get a C5 back-to-back, -back and you know a C5 I think has a quarter-inch web, target three aces connection plate, quarter-inch web. Now all of a sudden you're talking about like taking up an inch of that like continuous insulation space. I'm just gonna ignore the flanges for now, but uh, we're talking about the web, you know. And uh, and but it's 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 better than a tube in that in that instance. It's better than having that air that you can never get to it. Maybe you're gonna kid yourself. You're gonna say I'm gonna drill some holes in it. We're gonna inject foam. But you can never inspect that that is like perfectly done. I've seen it suggested and you can't ever you can't ever tell, right? Like you can't ever make sure that that actually happens. Um, so the more that we can get to this, the better. Um, the challenge becomes, I'm just gonna go back one slide real quick. And this is not at a column, right? They show it really nicely at a column, but when it is off of a column, and there's a beam there. A tube is great with torsional resistance. A light bar is not very great with torsional resistance. So having some kind of a kicker or a roll beam or something along those lines is a fantastic way to resolve that. So the next topic, balconies. All right, there's a little plan showing kind of a few different, there's supposed to be some blue in there where the thermal break is, but Kind of showing two different schemes. You got a traditional balcony, you're just running that floor framing out, put a few moment connections on, keep the same beam spacing, and you know, keep the same deck direction span. 
concrete's poured out to it. Um, in a thermally broken balcony, try to minimize the amount of thermal bridges through the building envelope. Maybe I'm going to pick those outer two beams, keep those. I'm going to isolate my thermal breaks to those locations, change the deck direction span, and run run a beam that's going to header it off, and you can separate those two those two slabs right there. The trick with that is the same as with the building envelope. You've got this end plate moment connection that all of a sudden there's like kind of a threshold that's coming through there that might need a little bit of special attention to. Nothing insurmountable, right? With all creatives, so we can figure it out. But um, definitely one thing that needs to be paid attention to. Grab a water. Take another throw. Um, <clears throat> concrete thermal breaks, you know, a popular one out there, like the Shook Isocorb, like you've all seen that before, but this is kind of what I tried to pick there in that bottom sketch. You know, a traditional concrete balcony, we do, like I said, we do a lot of PT, RC, but PT, we're looking at like an 8-inch PT slab. We're going to run some balconies just straight off. Maybe drop that down a half inch to get a little bit at the right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. your positive drain slope to the edge of the uh, edge of the balcony, maybe you're going down to another inch and a half or an inch to the far edge. But it's a continuous thermal break, continuous, continuous thermal bridge the whole way along. Um now introduce a thermal break in this assembly. And <clears throat> Shook Isocorp makes a product. Um, I have not got the chance to, I've drawn it. I have not got the chance to see it constructed yet. <clears throat> so maybe we can make that happen at some point in time. Um, but the idea of this assembly is kind of, it's, it's interesting, right? Like in a balcony, you're always trying to resolve that negative moment. You're trying to resolve that negative moment over the top. So you're providing tension bars at the top. These black bars here is your tension bars, the straight bars. And what's interesting about this product is that blue section, they have like a low conductive, high compressive strength concrete, little cylinder square block element, compression block that they put into that element that's resolving the compression out of the bottom. So you're not getting continuous compression along the bottom face of that balcony. You're getting compression in isolated areas. <coughs> Depending on what the loads are from the balcony. And then between that, you get like a, like it's like a poly, polystyrene or some other kind of like insulated material. I'm calling on polystyrene, but like the insulated material between those thermal those compression blocks that are um, providing you the rest of that thermal thermal break. <coughs> Thermally broken relieving angles. These are these are the trick. These occur everywhere on every facade. And before, yeah, you know, I should have put this next slide first. At a minimum, we should do this. At a minimum. We should get away from continuous relieving angles and be doing offset relieving angles. As of those or not, let's just like do that, right? That works um, for like the vast majority of projects. Um, having like a knife plate or some kind of like T plate that comes through your WRD, comes through your insulated layer, you're passing three eighths of an inch, half inch at every you know, three feet, four feet on center, depending on the loads. <clears throat> and you've got a continuous relieving angle that is a rolled angle shape. One of the interesting things that, you know, um, anytime you roll bent plate, you've got a lot more, bit, you can add variation in sort of like its straightness and its levelness and all that kind of stuff. But a rolled angle shape has a lot more, um, it's straighter. I think it's the words. It's not coming to me, but like um, the other advantage to a detail like this is 
that whole angle assembly with the knife plates coming off of it, that all just gets galvanized, right? You send that to the galvanizer and the steel with the with the stiffener plate you just comes through the shop that is painted or unpainted and fireproof. And there's no like wondering, oh, do we need to like cold galvanize part of that uh, part of this stiffener plate or whatever it might be because it's coming through the water with the water resistant barrier and all that kind of stuff. You can galvanize, hot dip galvanize angle and T plate assembly. Try to make their lives easier and tell them they can mask off portions of it, which basically means tape off portions of it that don't get galvanized and get welded later, all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of flexibility with the detail like that. And in general, I think we should just move towards this, move move away from continuous removing aids. And I'm not standing in here as someone that hasn't done that. I've done that plenty of times too. So I'm just saying we should. Um, so back to this. And we learn in the book and the reading, and it, it, it can be done. Um, it's a very similar type of detail, which is locating that T plate. But we've kind of been schooled into locating it as close to the water resistant barrier as possible, locating it so the insulation is kind of lining up on that side. You all can school me on that. But uh, regardless, the big trick with some of this is like, Sequence getting the sequence of construction right. And I'm always encouraged to see lots of contractors doing their certified passive house certifications. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Build their certified passive house certificate. But, um, you know, <clears throat> having these removing annual assemblies um, and when the sequence of construction happens uh, is important to review with the construction team because at some point when these go up and the alignment of that, you know, you're closing the building envelope, and all of a sudden you might not have as much access as you think if you know the sequence is not timed right. Um, so I think the other aspect of this is as we move towards more high performance envelopes, they're growing, they're they're getting bigger, right? They're getting thicker, and in masonry cavity wall construction. That's just pushing the load further and further from their spandrel beam, which, uh, you know, for a P here and E between the two, right? You've got this moment of scoring that you're reducing on a perimeter beam. Uh, it's really going to require like a kicker or a roll beam. I know those are words we don't want to hear about, but like having sort of some kind of planning for something there. Or maybe it's just like a kind of extended stiffener plate, depending on the wood you're trying to resolve. All of these things can be possible depending on the situation. The other thing I wanted to say is like I drew kind of like an arrow on the right here saying the ideal location. In, in my mind, having that relieving angle within the approximate depth of the beam is ideal. It's not like you might have beams that are slightly bigger and smaller along the length of the decide I get that but like working with your structural engineers to define that it really depends there's a back and forth between like do we bring the relieving angle down lower so we can align it with the head of the windows and then not have to do relieving angle and uh loose windows um so I think there's certainly some flexibility in a detail like this you can kind of like extended W2 plates flip the angle the other direction, there's definitely some flexibility in how you do that. I think the trickiest thing that I often see to resolve is resolving it within the slab deck, which I know is like kind of a common detail we've done in the past, having an angle come off like a bent plate on the slab edge with some like threaded studs or any of those kind of things. So all those details resolved a little, or, relied a bit on like having a vertical slot the vertical leg of the angle with some washers that get welded and you know when you put a thermal break in there you know the previous details allowed for like shimming in that sort of cavity space to get that right like horizontal adjustability now you've got a thermal break and then you're adding are you adding steel um 
shims or you're adding on um, broken shims that are a quarter inch or however thick or what you need. Um, I just find that's a really challenging detail when we're looking at right at the slab thickness. Having like a little bit below, you know, that would be moving a little lower in the beam. Generally, I find it easy to resolve. But... All right, we already talked about this. That was a fun little notch I had to add in right at the end. I don't know if you all picked up on that, but <laughs> this is the magic of Revit. I love Revit. You know, I'm a big Revit guy. I, my father in law is a landscape architect, and when I was going into college, he gave me Revit W9. I like just build in and just said, Do this. And I was like all into it, doing all the tutorials. So, but this one burned me. I, you know, did a detail right at like the smallest speed, and then the next widest speed, and had to have that notch in it. We got to talk about our failures and successes, right? But all right, Donage Post. So, <clears throat> common to have dunnage and roof screens on the building. Um, I don't see a ton of complexity with this detail. I think of the ones that are fairly, you know, of the thermally broken details that are like in the steel part of the building, like the supported off the steel. For the most part, it's like a straight compression element. You know, you got a lot of, you might have like um, a little bit of bending in some of these posts for sure. Um, but it's mostly like an axial connection that you can generally resolve. Um, it might be a matter of adding a few more posts. You know, this was, I think this was on top of the last and all thermally broken sponge. So, can be done there, can be done. The, the, the thing about it is, if you imagine this detail at a roof screen, right? Having a roof screen where the bottom of the roof screen stops a little bit, maybe higher off the roof, is nice because then you can accommodate a few more of these things. Um, you just, you know, sometimes like the size of these plates can get in the way a little bit. Oh, the other thing I wanted to notice is like <clears throat> anytime something is galvanized, right? It's a closed shape, like a tube, it has galvanizing vent holes in it to make sure it doesn't create a pressure vessel, <clears throat> right? It's just you have to do it, you can't avoid it. Um, so the column is probably capped, it's got a cap plate with a galvanizing hole, and the bottom has another galvanizing hole. Um, Generally, these are called to be seal welded, you know, capped and seal welded, so they're not letting water through your, your roof membrane. Um, sometimes if you do the top, it's enough, right? Because um, then the bottom is enclosed in the roofing, if nothing's coming into the top, nothing should be coming into the bottom. Um, but when you get a situation where, like, you're you're all of a sudden bearing on something that's slightly compressible, like a thermal break. You have a whole bunch of holes in the bottom of your base plate. You're not really getting like uniform compression on that plate. You get this situation where you're getting like compression around like a Play-Doh extruder. Like, mm -hmm. Not that it would really work out that way, but that's kind of an over-exaggerated. So like call for it to all be plated and seal well. Um, anyway. <clears throat> All right. I said I would get to the hesitation instruction here. There's lots of text on this. And I'm not going to pretend to be like the spokesman for all sorts of things in the book. The nature of the code is interesting because the bolt council, like for high strength bolts, RCSC, has the specification in the AISC documents. Right. And the current governing code, IDC 2021, if for structural engineers in the room, that's the blue book. You know, it points to RCSC 2014. And what that says in RCSC 2014 is, you know, the provisions for high strength bolts 
These provisions do not apply when the material other than steel is included in the grip, nor are they applicable to anchorage. So the grip of a bolt is between the head of the bolt and the nut, basically. So between that grip, having material other than steel is not governed by that bolt grip. So if you get structural engineers are a little hesitant in terms of what they're designing because they want to put a thermal grip in that connection, there's a little bit of like reasonable anxiety there. Um, now, in 2020, over COVID, RCSC came out with a new document, which I think is in the latest AISC manual um, that was just issued. It's gold now. But um, <clears throat> they expanded the commentary a lot from this section to this whole gray section that involves a lot more, like, you can see all those bulleted points, right, um, that the engineer of record should consider when designing the connection of the thermal brick. Basically, they allow sort of like a pseudo uh, alternative means of like determining whether the engineer of record, based on their experience in the literature, determines that it's an acceptable thing to put in there. Um, so while that's not in the current, it is like an issued document by the same Bolt Council that can be used in terms of like justifying or making you feel comfortable in terms of the design of these types of connections. Brilliant out there. This is where I would say 99% of the anxiety comes with that. Aside from there being very little documentation from AISC, the American Institute of Steel Construction, on how to design a thermally broken connection, there's plenty of there's literature from the UK there is literature from conference proceedings and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to get into the actual specifics of how to do such, because we could spend an hour just talking about that. Um, and there's one structural engineer in the room. So I think <laughs> the value here is like presenting how we can work most collaboratively to make this kind of stuff happen. All right, lots of diagrams. Uh, so what I wanted to kind of, we talked about this a little bit, said I'm not a show for any one product. I don't really matter to me, you know. Uh, there's lots of pads out there um, <clears throat> and thermally broken connections. Uh, the essential parts is like, remember back to the steel classes, like a wide flame theme or any kind of like member, you know, you've got this, uh, diagram of the compressive strength across the cross section of the members, right? That's what you see right here, right? So you've got your most tension, like in a uniformly loaded beam, like this, like that. You've got that tension at the bottom, compression at the top, kind of flip flops when you do a cantilever, right? But uh, that's why we end up with the wide frame section, and so they locate all the steel to those outer edges. Uh, that's where you need that, like compression resistance most. That's where you know what your bolts are doing or what your thermal break material is doing at certain parts of the beam. Um, and that's just resolving bending. Shear is like a whole other aspect of that. But, um, so that becomes important when we start looking at something like a shook isochord. Yeah, I think it's... <clears throat> A lot of folks don't kind of know the nuance of what the material, like the products are doing. There's two types of products, right? There's an N module um, and a V module, right? The N is for tension only, and the shear will resolve shear and tension. So a shook isocore works fundamentally different than a pad. A pad is like uniform bearing across thermal break, a shook isocord, the insulation is non-structural. You can take it out. It does not do us anything in that, this, this product, right? What you're doing, if you can see in the diagram right here, there's like a little, I believe it's a stainless steel tube right there with two end plates that when and the bolts come through with like two kind of nuts on the inside of the end plates. So 
you put this where you need the compression. So at the bottom of your wire plane, and this one is loaded. In the bottom here, where you're trying to do like a canopy out right here, right? You, you got your compression element. You're getting straight steel to steel compression. It's not bottom element. And you have these end modules at the top, which you can see is just a threaded rod with four nuts on it. It'll be the same steel. But uh, you're resolving the tension out of that rod at the top. So you can see if something was like presented in a product data submittal, and you weren't looking closely at which they were showing the right spot. You've got a lot of steel fabricators and designers that are doing, they know what they're talking about. But it's important to understand the differences between these two models. Because you look at them and they look very similar, like the, the insulation around them, but they do fundamentally different things. Right? So it's important to kind of understand what that's out of And I put this up here for the concrete because it kind of relates back to the isochord. The other things called like the concrete thermal break material in that like um let's see. so that diagram is related for a uniformly loaded beam, right? Tension at the bottom, compression at the top. In a cantilever, it's the flip. Right, so that's why you see compression at the bottom and the tension bars at the top. So, like you're just taking straight tension at the bottom, and then you've got that stress block, and that's where they're providing that low conductivity, highly compression resistance concrete block to match that stress diagram. It's just flipped because it's a Do you have any lead time issues with any of these products? Before. The only product I've been able to use is in a I'd love to use the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> so the other aspect of this, and I'm just this is not specific, this is a Fabrica table. <laughs> this is not specific to Fabrica, right? Paying attention to compressive resistance <clears throat> and um Compression modulus and all that kind of stuff is hugely important, right? Those two, those two thermal breaks there, they're both tin, right? One's a tin on an F, one's a tin. But they work very differently. They have vastly different compression resistance, right? One's FRP, one's fiberglass. Fiberglass reinforced plastic, and one's a closed cell all year. Right, one has 640 psi, and the other has 38,900 psi. One can be used in structural finishing. One is a uh, non-structural, very, very lightly loaded structural finishes. They're both green. They, they're both called tin. It's it, it sounds silly, but I know that it's happened. Right, that the two get flopped. So you gotta kind of like really pay attention to what you're getting and what you're asking for. And that brings me to my next point. We should be issuing thermal structural thermal break specs. They should be with concrete, they should be with steel. We should have a structural thermal break spec. It's not enough to just write the brick pad or thermal break material on a drawing without also providing a specification that tells them what you're looking for. You don't need a spec for Brita. There's plenty of manufacturers out there, Armatherm, Thermal Bridging Solutions, sells pads, and Bell Rubber, all sorts of stuff. Like, there's plenty of pads out there to use, but we need to issue a spec that tells them a minimum performance design. But what we expect out of these values in terms of compression strength and even the thermal conductivity that, like, we would look to our building sciences folks to kind of help us specify. Because um, they have different values there too, right? Depending on what you're at. I can see why this would be very attractive at 2.9 versus 0.29. To expand on that a little bit, I've even taken that specification and applied it to foam that's underneath foundation. Yeah. I haven't taken that one on yet, but I agree with you that we. I'm getting asked to. 
certain things. And yeah, I'm on board. Yeah, no, I get it. I'm totally there. Um, just quickly, the that's the question. Would you say that that's the structural engineer record? You should be writing that, or I believe I my personal opinion because it has the structural press resistance. Right. It should be maybe in a word document that can then be edited a little bit and like thermal conductivity and stuff added in. Um, yeah, it's tricky if you also delegate the design of the connection, like you need it at all or whatever kind of stuff. Somewhere somebody needs to say <clears throat> what the minimum standard is. So, all right. Am I doing the time? Which is right. Uh, other products. Barrel fast bracket, right? That's another product out there. Um, super cool on a space, right? Like it seems, it seems, it seems great. Um, I have no inherent space for it, and you can do it right. Like it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great solution. Um, especially like. It's a completely delegated design product, right? They design the whole assembly. They'll design the bracket, the relieving angle, the connection back to structure, all this stuff. They'll submit you shop drawings with calculations and everything. Um, <clears throat> I believe we could not go quote me on this. Oh, I'm on record, right? I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Generally, small enough. That you may see your trades can claim them, which is interesting when you start thinking about union labor and all this kind of stuff, steel versus masonry. I believe that is part of their marketing. Um, I guess I, I think it's a great, like, it looks, it's a very unique product. It's essentially an offset relieving angle, right? And we've added some cutouts to lessen the amount of thermal bridge that are coming through the relieving angle. The way it works is you have this slotted diagonal connection with like another washer and you kind of bolt it or do some kind of it's usually a, a structural bolt or an extension or some kind of other anchor to concrete into the building um and you put these in space and them all along and you have a light relieving angle that slides up into this bracket and sits on those little hanger tabs One thing I would say is like it, what's also cool is they have like a pass through has to be certified component by uh pestilences. But like you gotta pay attention to if it's stained steel. Oh cool. Um it just where um your um Sure. Yeah, you do bring through two versus you bring through two that are kind of like cutouts through your garment instead of one solid piece of steel. You break through less material because of it. Hopefully, I, I could see that making this come. Everything's countable, right? That's kind of one of the things that I find exciting about where we are right now is like there's a lot of people really interested about this and there's a lot of opportunity available to make it really good. Um, but I <clears throat> I think more so for, they have a lot of great literature in terms of like how you correct dollies. Like you got to have the staggered connections so that they're both kind of working against each other. If you add them all together, you can see just all kind of shifting in one direction, stuff like that. Um, and then the other thing, I don't mean this to be a knock, but I think it's a great product. I really do. The one thing I would just say is like when you're looking at like a, a hung, extended hung. The lead angle assembly with the mason wall that's providing backup to that. Backup to that. Like the load kind of coming in that wants to kick. Right? And, and this comes from the primary wall providing 
that resistance to the home bracket on it to kick into the building, right? So having some kind of like a piece of steel on the back face of that, or maybe it's a masonry wall. Um, they may I could be I could be incorrect, but to me, like you show that bracket a couple two feet three feet down on the edge, having that sort of assembly or something to resolve some of the forces in the loop would be important. Are you able to insulate between the bracket or is that? Yeah, they have a little piece that will go inside. All right. Structural references for relieving angle and thermal break design. Um, hopefully, we can send this out. Okay. After, yeah, awesome. So, a great one is the Charles Pankow paper that was done by uh, Jerome Hajar. Uh, Northeastern professor Mark Webster, SGH. Um, a great paper that studied thermal break design. A um, lot of great kind of findings that come out of that. Um, one of the important ones that I think I had written down, but maybe I forgot to mention, and when you're one of the things that came out of that presentation or that 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 study. It's like 300 something pages on, um, but a lot of great info in terms of when you're designing a thermal brake pad, you want to limit the amount of stress on the pad to 30% of its ultimate strength. So for the structural engineers, like what's the 30% of the ultimate strength is like what they kind of found the sweet spot for like a snug tight and bold um, in terms of limiting the pad and having limited like having the best performance related uh, aspects of that. Um, performance? Uh, structural, structural, what did I say? Did I them? Oh, okay. No, no, like you want to limit the pads so you're reducing any sort of like creep and then further rotation with the leading angle. Um, so limiting it to 30%, which when your pad is 38,000 PSI is in the realm of the achievable things that you can do. All right, additional resources. This is this is me. I mean, I years ago found mostly out of frustration and out of like, get to what we do, right? Like I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna find all the references on, I'm, I'm a stubborn engineer, right? I wanna find the references on why do I have to do this thermal bridging? Our thermal bridging mitigation. So I stumbled upon like the building envelope thermal bridging guide to put out by these hydro and Martian Hirschfield. I just learned like last week that there's this awesome online reference for that whole document. <laughs> and you don't need to like go back and forth and blue beam of a thousand pages. <laughs> um, so thermal bridging calculations is the uh, thermalbridge.ca. Which I found, and I point this out, um, CMAS, Structural Engineers Association in Massachusetts, just had an engineer from RDH on recently to talk about, you know, thermal bridging and building envelope design. And I think that that's a wonderful thing for our structural engineering community, recognizing the need to like pay more attention to this stuff. Um, a great presentation that, you know, the, Seeing the thermal bridging, thermal bridge ICA kind of came out of that presentation by Jeff. And speaking of RDH, like they have a great technical library. Like if you go to the that link, the building signs, tons of webinars, papers, and all sorts of stuff. You can go for hours looking at this stuff. Pretty much all available for free on there too, which is great. Um, and similar SWAT. As the buildings of Beyond podcast, if any of you guys haven't listened to it, it's, it's an interesting podcast. Um, that's where I get my knowledge about why air control is so important and all this kind of stuff. So, all right. And then, like, look to the future. If we talked about it before, early collaboration, you know, an emphasis, we're all on the same team. We're all trying to, like, make these details the best that we can. And we're in this unique situation where like kind of like paving the way 
on a lot of these aspects and things. So everybody's trying to do their best, get the best, most efficient building. And I think one of the interesting aspects of passive house is like structural engineers were kind of mostly stuck in the body carbon world of things. And this is our one foray into like operational carbon where we get to actually have an effect on it. Tons more work to do on the body carbon, no doubt. But like we get to kind of like play a tiny little role into either like it performing well or not performing well. Um, so that's kind of encouraging to me. We really need a design guy from the AIFT on film versus design. Like, is it really about time that we have something on those lines? We just don't have it. There, in one of those references we had before, um, there is a guide from uh, the Steel Construction Institute in the UK that has some guidance on it um, and sort of like, you know, what your compression area should be and like what's kind of acceptable for certain, what kind of thickness is acceptable for certain types of bolts or what the reduction should be for your bolt. Um, but you're having to kind of like translate from the UK document. Um, so having all those papers and those webinars, super helpful. There's a great AISC night school from the engineer at SGH. His name's escaping me right now. Oh, a wonderful night school I've watched myself. Um, really helpful. I put that in the link on the reference guides. There's actually two hour long seminars on it. And then, um, research on like, this is not a topic I know a ton about, but like fire exposure, thermal break, pads, and all sorts of stuff in the building. I think they need to know a lot more talking about it and then like thinking about what the right types of materials, because all these different manufacturers make different, slightly different types of materials. Um, that I think it's kind of an important aspect of the comparable design picture. Um, and on that uplifting note, I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for putting all that together. It was wonderful. Uh, if there's any questions, we have time for a few. And that goes for folks online as well. If you want to ask some questions in the chat room, I'm more than happy to ask them here in the room. Any questions? It's from the structural engineer's perspective or experience on the enclosure side. I would say we've also had same encounter with every concrete thermal break, yeah. essentially <clears throat> starting in design and never really making it out of design. For us, the biggest hurdle has always been like there's no specific code requirement that says thermally we have to do it. So now that's in the code. Have to do it so we have that tool in our pocket which is green from the structural engineer side is it always a cost thing what are you pushing for to, does it just simplify the design like what are the hurdles that make it go away uh yeah it's complicated like any of these uh, uh, things is complicated um and depends on what kind of concrete you're working with I think for the vast majority of the projects that we specified, it's been mostly a cost thing. I think the more products that enter the market, when that cost comes down, the better we are. Um, and it being like a requirement now, I mean, certainly starting to cross the country, like I think that you'll start to see more of that entering the market. There's another company out of Ontario that makes a very similar thermally broken getting the name of them right now, but like they make a similar product. Um, so it's not um sure if it makes it, but um you know there's nuance in terms of like if you do PT, yeah. like you need continue you need mostly like continuous access to the slab edge. You know, to stress the tendons right at the end. So like once you put this cast in thermal break and you can't get access to it or to how does that complicate the access to your post tensioning tendon, now nah, what do you do? You know, you like maybe hopefully you have staggered balconies and you flip them up what's the dead end and the live end of the tendon and access it from the other side, but it just gets gets complicated from that. We even had one where the price came back surprisingly low. 
And the ownership team was like, it's too well. We don't believe you. We're still not required to share it. Like, <laughs> we're still going to yeah. eliminate it from this yeah. because we think that there's just unpredictable causes later on that will come up. And no amount of like full analysis or uh, enclosure analysis that we could have provided to sway them otherwise because of precedent and it not being required on certain. Now, now that it's in the code yeah. and we have that to fall back on. Like I saw a building in Toronto recently that had a bunch of these all over the place. You know, I think as you're going to see more of these, like Toronto does a ton of high rise yeah. concrete construction, folks since you know the ones that uh, just start putting it in there. I, mean, I think we'll just see more and more of that. I think it's more familiar to be able to it. I have another yep. Yeah. Single things. Ah, I did you see I titled it new construction. I, 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 I left it. off the hard part. I do notice that. But um you are there, I guess or one of the challenges other than the fact that the single thing building is the structure's already there. But if you were to retrofit, uh oh um, endless challenges. Yeah. <laughs> I know, honestly, like it's it's tricky, right? Because the best way to save carbon is to use right there roads, like just to reuse roads and build buildings that are adaptable. Um, we built a ton of buildings out of the way that are not adaptable to anything but residential. Um, but that aside, we need more housing. I, I'm going on topic, but you know, uh, existing buildings like. When you look at reskinning the building, it sounds nice on its face. I think it has a lot of challenges architecturally, um, window sills and thresholds and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, on the other side of it, we have a ton of mass masonry wall buildings. Mm -hmm. Maybe make it a little bit easier, but. Breaks you can't, so but the, you just reskin the entire building. On the mass masonry wall buildings, um, what I've seen them done is from the inside. So oh, all yeah. the insulation okay. and the air barriers and all that stuff actually happen on the inside of the building. Mm -hmm. And then you've got numerous issues with where the joists are framing in walls where you kind of have to yeah. play around with everything. But I've also had to tear off the structure that's right adjacent to the masonry wall and kind of rebuild it in a thermally adaptive way. See, it's, it's just a new challenge for everything, right? Like it's it's a it like I mean that like it's an exciting time to be in the building industry. There's there's we're kind of like paving the way. All right. I think uh, I don't see any online here, so we're gonna call it. Thank you so much.